I suspect this is going to be somewhat change of kind of emphasis. So I'm really interested in looking at the wider context of HT of R and HDA rather than uh, sort of specific methodologies. And it's based on my experience of using R over quite rather too long a time period. So just a bit of background. <laughs> I started playing with data back in uh, mid-90s, and I was primarily a SaaS user, and I was working in the farmer industry. One of the things I did at the time was develop an interactive website, which basically queried databases, generated web pages, and so on, using a thing called SaaS intranet, which effectively predated our Shiny. Uh, we used SAS Macro to generate formatted PDF reports and analyses, effectively predated our markdown. I used SAS IML, interactive, um, interactive matrix language, to implement Markov models. But then at the time I was introduced to R by a New Zealand statistician, because we were starting to use it for trial simulation. And this is fairly early on, I think R came in about 93, I think. I was looking earlier. That's when I first came across on. I thought it's really interesting. And when I moved to the Center of Health Economics here in York uh, and developed my first model in R, which was back in 2004, and that was for um, a nice review. We were the ERG evidence review group for review on anti-epileptic drugs. And I decided to build a model in R, and I thought this was fantastic. So I could integrate the evidence synthesis, I could integrate the analysis and so on. And importantly, the thing I thought was absolutely brilliant, I could publish the whole model as an appendix to the NIHR HTA report. So I thought that was absolutely brilliant. And then afterwards, I went on and used R extensively for modeling and evidence synthesis. Whenever I was doing network measure analysis, generally used R to wrangle and link for data. And then in 2010, produced my first interactive evidence synthesis using, at the time, our DECOM RxL, and then worked with people in Leicester, or in fact, the people in Leicester coming to consult with me, and we produced our first interactive cost-effectiveness model and synthesis, again, using RxL. And this was kind of an experiment. The idea was we'd, they would develop an interactive model and synthesis, take it to a nice committee, the nice committee could actually say, well, do what if uh, uh, and play around with this model. But interestingly, that wasn't in the way a great success. And I now sit on a couple of committees and I understand why. The last thing we, we want to, in the limited time we have in committee meetings, is spend a lot of time messing around with models. So sometimes things you know, kind of look useful, but turn out in practice not to be. But other times they can be incredibly useful, like I think developing the model in R for epilepsy incredibly helpful. And it was also, the model itself was a semi-Markov model, it would have been awkward, to, well, involved to implement in Excel, lots and lots of tunnel states and so on. So there is a place for it, but it's not everywhere. And some things you think would be a really good idea, like presenting the committee with an interactive model may not be. And now more recently, I spent quite a lot of time developing our Shiny apps. So I'm uh, interested in how we use them to synthesized data. And again, this is where interactivity is really useful. The one on the left, what I'm interested in is how patients think about data and how patients uh, analyze data in light of their own preferences. And there you do want an interactive model because patients have different things they worry about. Some worry about adverse events and around effectiveness. And the idea of this tool is that patients themselves can select the things they're interested in and get a nice diagrammatic representation uh, of the comparisons between treatments. And this is building on some work from UCL. And then the one on the right, this is coming from a diagnostics field. I'm really interested in early models for technology developers to get some idea of what the parameters are for their technology, in this case, their diagnostic to be superior or not. So this allows you to plug in assumptions around sensitivity, specificity, and so on and so forth. And the R-Shiny stuff is just brilliant for that. So again, you know, the interactive stuff has its place. So that's very quickly about my experience, which is sadly quite, quite I put the dates in this quite a long time. Um, so but let's go on to the good. In fact, I'm not going to spend so much time on the good because it's, I'm preaching to the converted, but it allows us to integrate data, access analysis and presentations. It's brilliant for that. It's open source, 
very rich environment, incredibly rich statistical environment. We just seen a fantastic example. Good range of data types are very strong in our list, factors, and so on. It's got scoping, so we can have you know, kind of scoping within functions and so on. That works really well in all kind of hierarchy. Data handling is incredibly powerful compared to something like Stata, which is just a, it's a flat sheet, horrible. Functional program, I love functional programming. That's great for modeling HDA. We develop functions, we then put the different parameters into the arms, much better than the different spreadsheets we get in Excel. And for those who are level above me, you've got object-orientated models. In fact, we've got at least three different models for that. Vectorization, got the Hadley Wickham stuff, GG plot, tidy verse, like GG plot is fantastic. I say expressions open access. It's easy to build interactive web apps. I mean, that's an incredible thing, but I can sit myself and develop an interactive website. Good support for parallel processing, integration with other apps. So let's look at the bad and the ugly. So I've lumped the bad and ugly together as A, they overlap like AI and children becoming teenagers. And also they're the incorrectly ordered. It should be the good, the ugly, and the bad. Uh, and like these cartoon characters ordered on kills. And when I was looking, starting, looking at this, I came across this, Reese Godding, A Year With R. It's a really nice blog where he is a programmer coming to R and spent a lot of time talking about his experiences. Now, in my mind's eye, he does look like Russell Crowe, but I suspect he doesn't in reality. So I have to, I, I stole shamelessly from him for some of the bad and the ugly. R can be arcane. I mean, in fact, there's a blog about R will be arcane. It was a learning curve. It takes time to learn it, but it's very powerful. Some things are worth the effort. And this is the kind of example they give. This is also why I hated Tidyverse when I first came across it. Having learnt R base back in um, like 2000, whenever it was, yeah, when I first started seeing Tidyverse code, I hated it. It was just a completely new model. I slowly come around to using it because everybody else does, and some bits of it are quite nice. These are some examples from the Godding blog. I mean, signing y to negative two by y less than minus space minus two, that's a really clumsy kind of construction. And then having the two assignment operators, the equals and the arrow, as it were. And then double, single and double square brackets. Trying to get things out of lists, painful. And the dollar operator, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So there are some things in R which are not super consistent uh, and, and super slick, but it's not alone in being arcane. Um, if anyone's ever used SAS macro, we've got the ampersand, the ampersand, ampersand, and the ampersand, ampersand, ampersand operators, which the whole thing's built around. We also got SAS screen control language, which is this is a bit of a, from the manual. So yeah, in, in fairness, it's not the only thing which is arcane. It's a bit bloated, maybe. We've got multiple patchy. Packages doing similar things, meta, meta for R meta is a bunch of network metro packages. You get fear of missing out. Are we using the right package? But that, yeah, that comes with the statistical richness. Godding talks about syntactic sugar. And this, so you've got this names function, which is a function which is both for interrogating the names of an object and also setting the names of the object. So that's done to make it a bit easier to set, but it is, it, you know, it's not strange. We've got a whole bunch of different apply functions, which I find myself using randomly to find the right one. Mm -hmm. T and F being used for true and false, but also being something we can assign a value to. You know, not, I mean, it's not great in, in R. Personal thing really more than collapsing dimensions. And it's on the age of, you know, until I find drop equals false. But yeah, that, I used to have to work around that. Non-standard evaluation, this I didn't know about, so I looked at Goldling's book blog. So the with function, there is a warning in the help that we should not use it in programming because it could accidentally override local variables. And Golding, or Golding says, you know, this is crazy, the existence of functions, but are not for programming. That doesn't make sense. Speed. So when I used to do a lot, after a lot of simulation work, uh, lack of speed was a bit of an issue. You know, we've got C at the bottom, C is super fast. So it's, uh, uh, compiled language. Julia, I'm told, is very fast. I've not used it, but I've had people talking to me about Julia being good. Python seems to span a fairly wide range of speeds when we've got R. 
I personally think this is probably a bit less of an issue now because we've got parallel processing. We can just throw cores and CPUs at it. But and certainly in my new Mac Silicon machine, I'm, it's great thing it, hitting all 18 eight cores. It can be a bit unpredictable. So these are some examples from Dodding. So why is one equal? You make one equals character one true. Why is negative one less than false true? And why is one less than two false? And one of the things it does, and I did not know this until I started looking at God, is it, it, it changes, it casts uh, using C language. It can cast a variable when you stick it uh, either side of the comparator. And that's, that's not ideal. And I certainly have seen, um, remember looking at a model that someone had built a long time ago, and clearly they had not understood the syntax and it wasn't doing what they intended it to do. So R can trip you up and we have to be careful with it. It's not the tightest of languages. Am I doing for time? Perfect. And it's not the only show in town. This is the Tayobi list of kind of programming languages by um, popularity with Python sitting at top C, C++ and R coming in at number 17 in the charts. There are other things in there which you could use, MATLAB, obviously Visual Basic and so on. So there are other things we could think about using. And interestingly, this is a, an open source model, and I'm really keen on the idea of open source models. This is one for colorectal cancer, but this was built in MATLAB, and you can download the MATLAB code and so on. So there are other things we can look at. So in summary of my 18 or possibly slightly more than 18 years of experience, R is great, and I love R, I use this a lot, and it's cheap. SAS costs about eight <coughs> grand a year. SAS intranets, I use for the intranets and websites, that was a £20,000 license. SAS makes all this stuff incredibly acceptable, but it's not perfect. There are things that trip you up. I don't know if this comes from being an open source package where and stuff gets bolted on, but it's not in places super tight. And I, I said that rescolding blog, a year of art, I found incredibly helpful because it, so there were some things I knew about, but some things I didn't know about. But also interesting, it might not be the only game in town. Things like Julia might be interesting platforms for developing models and analysis. But at the moment, it is a really good option. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Neil, do we have any questions? Otherwise, I'm happy to ask. <laughs> so we, we had two kind of maybe slightly controversial questions yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was around the use of AI and how that links to, to R. And the other one I asked, which I was keen to ask you, which is when you think the time will come when more than 50% of submissions are done in R. I don't know, to be honest. And coming back to it being arcane, I say I sit on two committees. And when occasionally we look at models, and it can be easier to look at models in Excel, to do, to do a very quick interrogation, Excel models can be easier. R takes more time to dig into. And there is a, yeah, as I say, a learning curve. And there's lots of agencies which do not have the resources which NICE and ERGs have. So I think Excel will stick around for quite a long time. The flip side to that will be if we start getting a lot of good, reliable, validated open source models, that will help push it. Because if we think that these models are, are, are reliable, and certainly in the diagnostics committee I sat, sit on, increasingly we're seeing where you have a kind of simple diagnostic model, and then you're bolting on these disease and treatment models like the CR, colorectal cancer models. So that will drive it, I think, having a pool of validated models. I'm not going to say when. Oh, that's going to make me. That's going to be harsh to the tally. I'm trying to think actually. I know what we're almost seeing at the moment. Um, maybe, yeah. I don't know. A couple of few years. Okay. Excel runs out of steam pretty quickly, to be honest, with the building models. Any others? Uh, Howard. You, you recently mentioned the price of SAS and obviously the price of other statistical software. If price wasn't an issue, do you, would you be recommending we all be using SAS now? Um, that's a difficult question. I know the things I like about SAS, it's very solid, it's very, very tight, and it's very backward compatible, but it doesn't have the richness of R, 
is that you know, the, the fact is that generally, I find if I want to do some statistical, someone's implementing the package, it, it's uncanny how people have got there before me. So I'm willing to take the price of being a bit low to and a bit unpredictable for that richness. So no, I don't recommend using SAS. And we have one question in the Q&A. It's from James O'Mahony. Uh, were you nervous about some costs of learning a new language as an early adopter before uh, others caught on to R? I just completely, no, I, I was told by the, the guy called Steve Vanderhorn, who was a you know, uh, Kiwi statistician from the University of Auckland, so he knew gentleman, and he just, he sold it, basically. So I was very excited about pushing it. What I do regret is not finding, uh, pushing a bit harder at the time. I remember talking to um, someone from the LH team talking about doing a monograph, but at the time there just wasn't that much interest. And there was a lot of resistance about submitting models. I know at least one submission I did a long time ago, we did an R model. We had to do an Excel version of it because ERG wouldn't accept it. But now I'm, I'm really, I've always really enjoyed playing with it. So I think following on from that one there, Excel isn't going anywhere. It's embedded. SAS has competition. R has basically taken SPSS as lunch. Is R here to stay? Or do you think anything could replace it because of the wonk using what, what would it take to replace R? How do you think? I would have said so a little while ago, I'd have said speed because speed was a real problem in R, especially doing kind of the DOI, the EDSI type stuff. And also the fact that everything was held in memory was a real pain in the neck. But as but also said at some time, I mean, in some ways, computer power would simply catch up. And I think that's happened. So that, that's less of an option. Um, I think as uh, Golding says, yeah, it's not the greatest programming language, but it's a great statistical programming language. So I think it's going to be here to stay for quite a long time. Um, and again, going back to your sunk, the sunk cost question, the reason I've not looked at Julia and stuff like that, because now I, it's not worth me spending the time learning something new. So I think it's, it's got kind of a, a network effect, which will keep it. System, isn't it? Yeah. I agree about the packages. It's just yeah. Stuff. And I think some of the weaknesses of kind of the, the computing power we'll, we'll deal with anyway. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Neil.